Welcome to Studio Berlin, our weekly current affairs show here on KCRW Berlin. I'm your host, Sumi Somaskanda. My fellow countrymen, in a few hours, a dream will become reality. After more than 40 years of bitter division, Germany, our fatherland, will be united again. That was former Chancellor Helmut Kohl speaking just before German reunification on October 3, 1990. East and West Germany became one. There were wild celebrations and jubilation among East and West Germans. It was an historic moment, less than a year after the Berlin Wall had fallen. For East Germans in particular, reunification meant access to new opportunity and freedoms, but many of them faced a very different reality. The period after reunification brought trials and tribulations. And now, 30 years later, there are real questions about how unified Germany is. Let's discuss all of that with Anke Domscheid-Berg. She's a member of the German parliament for the left party, Die Linke. She is from Brandenburg in former East Germany. Hello. And Ned Richardson-Little, historian and research fellow at the University of Erfurt. Hello. Great to have you both. Anka, let's start with you. Take us back to around 30 years ago, uh, where you were, how you witnessed uh, German reunification. What do you remember about that? I was uh, still a student at that time. The uh, fall of the wall was in the middle or at the, rather at the end of my art studies, where I studied south of Germany. And I was uh, very active in the opposition. So when the wall fell, I was at one side really, really happy, but on the other side... I was sure that that means the end of my dream and the dream of many other oppositional people, uh, which meant not just adopting the capitalism side from Western Germany, but to to find a better option combining um, democracy and uh, socialist visions. So when nearly a year later the reunification took place, that was ultimately for me fixing the end of this idea of a third possibility of a different option. So we were basically kind of, it it felt like an an action because we also had very little influence. There was not a a new joint constitution developed, for example, where you could have the feeling you bring something into it. It was like just they take us over and we get all the laws they already have. There's nothing we can really contribute. And I think this kind of the process still has an impact today on how people in the East perceive their own role in the entire bigger Germany now. That concept of of annexation is one that I've heard often now from many East Germans. So we'll come back to that point. Ned, I want to bring you in here. Tell us more about that year between when the wall fell and reunification, because now in hindsight, a lot of people see that as an obvious course of events. But tell us how that came to be so quickly. I think that nowadays it's very much seen as obvious and self-evident that Germany was going to unify between East and West after the fall of the wall. But there was a great deal of uncertainty after the fall of the wall and for many months afterwards. It's easy to forget that even after the wall had opened on November 9th in 1989, that the Socialist Unity Party was still actually in charge of the country. The Stasi, the secret police, were still extant. And it wasn't for several months that this political apparatus was actually taken apart, that you don't have uh, the Social Security Party finally abolished its own monopoly on power at the beginning of December, and you have the occupation of Stasi offices by citizens who went and stormed into them to try and prevent the destruction of documents. And in this time, you have a great deal of trepidation about the idea of unification, not only from people within Germany, but also people in other Western countries that leaders in France and Britain were skeptical. You even had former U.S. President Richard Nixon, who saw talking about reunification as something that would exacerbate Cold War tensions. And you have a rapid turnaround in a few months as uh, the situation in the country worsened economically and as you had a campaign for the first openly competitive elections that, although many had expected Social Democrats to do very well, there's a turnaround in which the Christian Democrats and a a conservative coalition ended up winning a near total majority in the first elections, putting the country on a path to rapid reunification. 
And so we saw also in the course of the year how the economic aspects started to play out of what the economy would look like after reunification. Ned, we heard this just now from Anka. So by the time we get to October 3rd, 1990, are East Germans souring on this idea? What is the mood at that time? I think the country has always been split to some degree on what's going on, that in late 1989, you have these two competing programs, one from within East Germany of people saying they want to create a new kind of democratic socialist East Germany to try something different with the collapse of state socialism, and on the other hand, this push from the West led by Helmut Kohl for a rapid program of reunification. And these divisions never really go away in that first year, even when reunification becomes the main point on the agenda. Anka, take us through the time right after reunification. You said that you were no longer able to fulfill your dream politically. How did the mood start to change in the East as well? Was there a realization that uh, reunification wasn't going to bring some of the benefits that perhaps had been promised or expected? Well, of course, there were many really tangible benefits, like uh, all sorts of freedoms we didn't enjoy before, like simply freedom of speech, freedom of travel, I saw lots of parts of the world in the first years after uh, the wall fell. Also freedom of education for some, because we had a very uh, great education, but it was in some regards, it was limited. For example, I wanted to study Spanish language and French language at university, but because I had an uncle in Western Germany, the brother of my mother, I was not allowed to study a capitalist language because maybe I get contacts to people from Western European countries and then I have this uncle and I could just flee. So now I could study Spanish and I did together with international economics, but also there were lots of uh, real problems nobody anticipated uh, so much before. For example, I studied applied textile art. I finished in 91, so a few months after the reunification. And I already had a contract for my first job. But three weeks later, that um, company didn't exist anymore. And nobody even told me. And that happened all the time, that people were losing their jobs and in the millions, that companies just ceased to exist from one day to another. And you didn't even know how to deal with it because the concept of unemployment was unknown to East Germany. So it's really, really typical biography um, for East Germans after the wall fell was several zigzags. They did really completely different professions, just like me moving from um, textile art. Then I've worked several years in West Germany, what many, many young people did. They just went away from East Germany and most of them or the the biggest demographic group of those moving away were young uh, females from East Germany with high levels of education. So I was exactly one of this group. And um, this is an experience many, many East Germans share. And I think it's also something we can today, we can benefit from it because I am a, a politician with main focus on digitalization. So what we now face as a globe in all countries, not just in Germany, is an industrial revolution changing everything. And that is exactly the situation we had after reunification and after the wall fell. Everything changed in society. Jobs changed. Professional qualifications changed overnight. Nobody needed Russian teachers anymore, for example. Yeah? So lots of things changed. And from that change experience, nearly all East Germans still have. We can learn a lot. Ned, I want to bring you in here with one more question to that period. And from your perspective as a historian, what you just heard from Anka, how representative was that experience? And what were those challenges? Why weren't they addressed perhaps uh, more adequately by the new uh, reunified government? On the one hand, East Germany was hit by the same processes of deindustrialization that West Germany had already gone through in the 1970s and 1980s. So there's a larger problem that East Germany had lost most of the markets for its manufactured goods and for a lot of things like electronics. And so it was going to be a difficult transition. On the other hand, the process of privatization was done in a way that also led to the destruction of a lot of workplaces, jobs, and also to organizations that could have been economically viable if different choices had been made. So for example, this organization called the Toyhan Commission, which was in charge, was very ideologically committed to privatization at a rapid pace. 
And in contrast to, say, Czechoslovakia, where a voucher program was used to try and make the state property something that belonged to everyone in some way, in this case, East German companies were sold off at a fire sale. And you had West German companies coming in, in some cases, and buying companies in order to kill off the competition, or they're simply eliminated by this commission. And in other cases, you had whole segments of the economy that were restructured as quickly as possible on the idea that we needed to have an efficient economic logic. But in the end, this led to a huge deficit for the toy hand, which had been initially expected to actually produce a profit. And it was in the end left with billions of marks in debt. Okay, so we're talking about real economic turmoil at the time. Let's come to where we are today. And Ned, just to follow up on that, how much of that time do you think affects uh, some of the, the debate that we have about the divide between East and West today? I think it's really crucial to understand the 1990s as something that set the stage for what's going on now, but at the same time not necessarily give in to some of the narratives that are being put forward that simplify things. That, On the one hand, uh, one of the things that I think that is in- crucial is this problem of out-migration that Anka mentioned, that you have so many people who left and this caused a huge amount of social damage in the East, that you had about 800,000 people who left just in 89-90, and this didn't stop after reunification. And then there was another wave of almost 200,000 people in the early 2000s. And this process of essentially giving up on certain communities or allowing whole industries to disappear without much in the way of a replacement meant that you had a lot of social fracturing and you had the perpetuation of economic inequality, which continues till today. And I think this is something that, in particular, the far right has been able to prey on recently as a degree, the sort of recent slogan of trying to say they are going to finish the process of 1989, claiming that they represent the forgotten man of East Germany. And that this version of things posits a ultra-nationalist and xenophobic political agenda as a way to undo the economic damage that happened to communities in the early 1990s. Anka, I want to play you something that we heard from the German Chancellor Angela Merkel last year uh, at the celebration for German reunification on October 3rd. And she herself is an East German. Let's hear what she said. We also have to acknowledge that 29 years after German reunification, surveys show that a majority of East Germans feel like second-class citizens. Anka, what do you make of what the chancellor said there? Because at the same time, by many measures, the former East really has caught up with the West, especially economically. If you look at the German government's report on unification, it says that the East German economy has done really well. It is at what was only 43 percent of the West German economy in 1990. It's now 75 percent of the West German level. We've also seen salaries and wages actually rise, and they're around 85% now of the West German level. So why do you think we heard that from the Chancellor? Well, it simply is the truth. And I, I don't even remember that she said that, but it's it's something I hear all the time, and I believe it's true. There is an economical uh, disparation between East and West, which means in East Germany you earn less, although you work longer. And so you can accumulate uh, less property over time. You have a higher unemployment rate, for example, much higher risk of poverty, especially if you um, get old. And still today, there um, we calculate our pensions based on so-called pension points per month worked. And the pension point for the same month worked and the same profession in East Germany still 30 years after reunification is lower than in the West. You also have the effect of East Germans not being part of uh, German elites. And I'm not talking only uh, about elites in entire Germany, where we have less than 2% East Germans in elite position, decision, higher decision-making positions. In all societal spheres like politics, economy, science, military, yeah, wherever you look, you don't see lots of uh, East Germans. But even if you look in Eastern states, still there, you have only something like 30% of elite positions in all those uh, spheres I mentioned coming from East Germany. You have more than 50% of state secretaries in East German uh, state governments come from the West. So how do you explain that to East Germans that decision-making is done by West Germans. That was something kind of natural 
in the first years after reunification because everybody could follow the idea that probably the elites at that eastern time were somehow ideologically spoiled so no use after reunification anymore so you needed fresh people yeah so that is understandable but after 2004 this number is going down it's not going up and those people who now enter an elite position it's extremely unlikely that they were ideologically highly influenced by east germany because they were just too young this is something east germans perceive they understand that their opinions and collective experience doesn't have any significance so it is as if we did not exist and that does something with people if it happens every single day Ned, what is your perspective on this? Uh, again, as a historian, there are those glaring disparities, yet at the same time, this was a mammoth undertaking bringing East and West Germany together. So seeing it from today's perspective, 30 years later, um, has this been uh, mostly a success? It's important to recognize that there, ha there were people who were winners and losers in the process. And at the same time, there are ongoing problems as a result of unification. And that some of them do go back to, as I've mentioned, this problem that reunification wasn't an integration of two states that were deemed to be sort of equal partners in the process. But you have the integration of the former East Germany into uh, the Federal Republic. And this is done in a way that you have the erasure of institutions, of memory, of cultural heritage in a way that for people is even in a situation where economic standards have improved, there's also a sense of social and cultural dislocation that came with it. Okay, we'll have to leave it there. Thank you again, Anke domscheit a member of parliament for the left party, Die Linke. Thank you. And Ned Richardson-Little, historian and research fellow at the University of Erfurt. Goodbye. We have to take a short break. When we come back, we'll hear the perspective of a young East German born the same year of German reunification and a West German who moved east after the fall of the wall. You're listening to KCRW Berlin on 104.1 FM. I'm Todd Zwillick. We named 1A after the First Amendment. It's for everybody, especially the curious. And because things are rarely black and white, 1A brings you all the colors. Join me weekdays and keep listening to this NPR station throughout the day. Tune into 1A, weekdays at 4 on 104.1 KCRW Berlin. Welcome back to Studio Berlin on 104.1 FM. We are looking at how unified Germany is 30 years after East and West were reunited. Let's get a West German perspective on this now. We're joined by Eckhard Boyle. He's a copywriter for print and online. He's originally from West Germany, but moved east to Rostock in the late 90s. Hi, Eckhard. Hi, hello. How are you? Good, thank you. Thanks for joining us. So you moved to Rostock from the West in the 90s. Tell us more about what was behind that. Well, I moved to Rostock in 1999 for uh, professional reasons, you know. I was looking for a job in advertising, and uh, I had to decide whether I would move to Frankfurt or Rostock. And so coming from uh, Bremerhaven at the North Sea, I decided I would prefer a city at the coast. And uh, Rostock is uh, located on the Baltic Sea, and I also like the, the team of the advertising company in Rostock, who are all like, like me, like uh, young people from all over Germany. So uh, all these conditions got me off to a very good start. So that came at a time where actually there were many, many thousands of people moving from the east to the west. You were going in the opposite direction. I mean, what was that like at the time? Well, um, it was not a big problem. There were not many animosities or anything. Uh, sometimes when discussions got heated, you know, or especially when uh, people had some drinks or so, they tended to talk to me uh, more openly. And I usually uh, was the only Westerner around, you know. And so I had to answer to all kinds of questions, like... Uh, to NATO activities or even American foreign policies. To, uh, to many people, I was the only West German they knew. And so uh, some even told me they, they, they liked it pr uh, pretty much uh, living in the GDR. So, uh, but I wouldn't call this uh, like um, big problems. You know, the, the good thing was most people only found out about me being from West Germany after they met me and talked to me. And that made it much easier for me. 
If we look at the situation today, 30 years later, we keep talking about the differences between East and West now. Do you still see differences there? Well, um, there are some differences, especially uh, in, the, in my generation. You, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm turning 51 this week, and uh, in my generation, everybody has uh, like a um, genuine uh, East German perspective on things, uh, while the younger generation, it's much different. And, um, well, in, in, in some moments, uh, for example, when, when I'm watching the news here at home with my wife, uh, I sometimes I still t- tend to take a, a genuinely Western perspective, meaning I, I look at the economical problems with maybe less empathy because um, the sheer numbers of investment in the East that were mainly paid for by, by the wealth of the, or la- like the economical power of the Western federal states, I mean, it's just gigantic. But on the other hand, um, the East Germans, they had to go through immense changes in their lives. And uh, many seem to be still traumatized by these changes and uh, then uh, I, I listen to my wife. My wife uh, sets uh, things straight for me in these moments. Um, she's from East Germany, and uh, so these are topics that we discuss once in a while. Yes, we do. How heated do those uh, discussions actually get? <laughs> well, we we are married, and we have a 14-year-old daughter, so uh, we are we are doing fine. You know, we discuss these things, and uh, well, most of the time I I tend to take uh, an East German perspective. You know, I've I've been here for so long. I think I probably even forgot what uh, what people in the West might think about these things. Is it important to you to celebrate 30 years of German reunification, this big anniversary that's coming up yeah. on October 3rd? Okay. Well, um, without the fall of the wall and um, reunification, I would never have uh, thought about moving to the East, you know. I, I, I never even went to the East uh, in earlier years, you know. I. I spent a lot of time in the U.S., I visited the East Coast, West Coast, everything, and, uh, but I never thought about going to East Germany. It was uh, like very far away for us. And so that, that tells you a lot about the, um, the mindset of young people in the 1980s. It was very different. And uh, I never would have had a chance to meet my wife if the, the wall wouldn't have fallen. And um, we wouldn't be a family today. So I, I love my wife, I love my daughter, so... That's a good reason to have a party, I guess. So let's, yeah, let's party 30 years of Germany. It's pretty much okay for me. <laughs> Thank you, Eckhard Boyle, copywriter for Print and Online, joining us from Rostock. Thank you very much. Let's get the perspective now from someone who was born just as reunification was happening 30 years ago. We have now with us Valerie Schönian. She's a journalist for Die Zeit in Leipzig, and she's an author as well from East Germany. She wrote a book we'll be talking about called Ostbewusstsein, which essentially means... East German sensibility or identity. Hi, Valerie. Hello. You were born after the fall of the wall in the year 1990 in the state of Saxony-Anhalt. Um, what did reunification mean for your family at the time? Actually, uh, a long time I had no idea what it meant because we never talked about that, actually. And I started to ask them a few years ago and then I recognized, okay, Of course, everything changed, yeah. For example, my grandmother, she lost her job after the fall of the wall. And my parents, they kept their job. But of course, every other circumstances they lived in before uh, changed, like the supermarkets, like um, the school system, like everything, you know. And when you um, experience that the whole system changed, of course, that also influences how you raise your kids and everything. So, yeah, it meant a lot, but I didn't know that for a long time. This was part of the research for your book. I mean, what struck you most about those conversations with your family, with your grandparents and also with your parents? I was surprised, like, how today, how you look on this world and the system and on the politics, how it is influenced by the things that happened 30 years ago. Because I went to my family to talk with them because um, I wanted to understand what is going on in East Germany and why there's this somehow different like in the thinking and in their perspective and then I recognize okay it, uh, it's of course because of the history you know and when you think about it for a second it makes completely sense because it's only like 30 years ago but when you are 30 years old and you never thought about it before then it surprises you if that makes sense. <laughs> And it's really interesting, as we said, you've written this book about it, and you said that the narrative surrounding East Germans and East Germany as a region has to be expanded. Uh, What do you mean by that? I mean, what should the narrative be? I may have to say what the narrative is 
uh, right now. It, the narrative is that the East German people don't really get the democracy, <laughs> don't know how it works, um, are a little bit like stupid, that's the cliche, and have a, a strange dialect, <laughs> and everything is empty. I don't know, the food is disgusting, and a lot of bad cliches. And my narrative about East Germany is completely different, because for me, um, East Germany is about all the, f the space that is still there, and space is always goes ahead with freedom, you know, freedom in thinking, freedom in how you can work, how you can build um, a creative world somehow. And yet one of the reasons we're talking about uh, East Germany in this context today is because we've seen that it's uh, perhaps drifting away a little bit, at least politically. So how do you see uh, the rise of, for example, the far right, right wing extremism in that region? For that, I have to say it's a problem like in uh, like everywhere. Yeah, that's because uh, the thing in Germany is that the people like to put that problem on East Germany. And um, it's not only an East German problem. But of course, you're right, we have the AFD, the right-wing party is much stronger in East Germany. And that is of, also because of the history. It's um, because all the changes uh, that happened there. It's because the people think, okay, no one ever from the politics never saw our problems. And now uh, we want to show them that we have enough. And so it's kind of a protest thing also. And of course, also a racism problem. We have that problem also like everywhere so that the people just don't care that the AFD is a racist party. But I think what the difference is between West and East Germany is that in uh, West Germany you had the 68s a revolution somehow and there the people started to talk about things like nationalism and uh, racism in the public and also in the families. And in the GDR you never had this Uh, discussion, this big discussion until this year about racism and everything, because the SED said, okay, we are an anti-fascist state, so the fascists are like in the West, so we don't have to talk about it. And of course, there were racists and Nazis and everything in the GDR, but there was no public discussion about it. So the people, I think, in East Germany j just don't know what it means to vote for a racist party. I'm curious, you know, you're 30 years old. If we look 30 years into the future, do you think we still need to be talking about East versus West? You know, what will East Germany mean to you at that point? Um, I think uh, we will still talk about it, but I think that's completely fine. <laughs> Because, um, of course, we are different somehow. We are, have a, a different history that will influence us also still in 30 years. But that's not a problem. That doesn't mean that the reunification didn't work or anything because I mean we have also Bavaria <laughs> we have Hamburg and everything and they all uh, talk about their um, identity and nevertheless they are part of Germany you know and I think we will talk about Eastern Germany about our different cultures and our different perspectives but that's not a problem we can be I can be uh, an Aussie <laughs> in Germany in a reunificated Germany. We'll leave it there. Valerie Schöne, I'm a journalist for Die Zeit in Leipzig and an author as well. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. That's it for this week's show. Thank you to all of our guests for joining us. Just a reminder that we are a podcast and you can find us on all of your usual podcast platforms. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. I'm your host, Sumi Somaskanda. We'll see you next week. <laughs>